Y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I have trouble with this mic sometimes. But it's a pleasure to be able to share with you all this morning. As Moses um, mentioned, I was um, um, just, you know, had different experiences in the ministry. And during my time at Eastern Michigan University is when I decided to um, join the Adventist movement. And it's just being a blessing, being involved in the uh, message of the church. And currently, um, just being a member of Detroit Northwest Church. I think we have some representation here this morning. So, yep, I see some Northwest members. So it's definitely been a pleasure to serve there and to experience God moving in our midst. And it's also a pleasure to have the honor to be able to share with you all this morning, um, specifically on this occasion of International Sabbath. And I believe that this is a very special event just because we were not always able to celebrate diversity. There was a time when diversity was an issue. And instead of gathering together with different cultures in a form of celebration, it would not be any occasion that merit, merited celebration at all. So the title of the message this morning is The Pride of a Nation. The Pride of a Nation. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and I invite you all to pray with me. Most kind and gracious Father, we thank you for life, breath, and all things. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ who has made this possible. The reality that we are gathered together here under only one name, only under one creed. So Father, we thank you that you have managed to bring together all different nations to worship under this one roof, and that in coming together here today and listening to your word that in some way we can become more like Christ is our prayer. So Father, we pray that you speak to our hearts each individually, that you would speak through me in a special way. You know I am but a man, Lord, and that I myself, Lord, am in need of your grace and your mercy. But we have witnessed what you are able to do through fallible men. So I pray that you perform your miracle works again this morning, and that you will communicate through humanity divine truths. Speak to us on the issue of unity through Christ Jesus, I pray in Christ's name, amen. 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 So as I mentioned, I believe that before we can truly appreciate international Sabbath or any type of gathering of different nations, we must first acknowledge why an event like this merit celebration. There was a time when gathering like this wasn't a celebration, but it was an issue. When diversity, instead of being something to take joy in, caused turmoil and strife. What do I mean? We all remember dark spaces in our history, right? The dark pieces of our history like the Rwandan genocide. And I remember looking over the, over the stories and facts about the genocide, you realize that in the short span of about three months, about 800,000 Rwandians were murdered just because of their nationality, where they were from. Hutus took it upon themselves to slay Tutsis because of anger, strife, and prejudice. We remember events in our history like the Holocaust, things that we don't like to talk about very much, right? Events where, in, I believe it was six million individuals, mostly Jews and several other minority groups were viciously murdered because of where they were from, their nationality. And we also remember things like the African American history in the Civil War, where close to 600,000 soldiers lost their lives in a war that spurred from nothing else but prejudice, discrimination, and racism. You see, these are all things that we could talk about and that we could think about to help us to understand what an international Sabbath is, but I don't believe that we each need, we need to go into much detail. Perhaps we've had our own experiences being a minority represented in a majority. And this morning, I want to take a moment to pause and see what the Bible has to say 
about the unity that can be experienced in the midst of diversity because contrary to what we think, diver or prejudice or discrimination or anything like that regarding where you came from was not only an experience from us, but it was something that we notice in scripture as well. I invite you all to turn with me this morning to the book of Numbers chapter 12. The book of Numbers chapter 12. And I'm gonna try not to take much of your time this morning. I know that we are all hungry and that we smell the food. So we'll be very straight to the point this morning. We're in the book of Numbers chapter 12. And I'll be reading from verse one. And when you're there, you can just say amen. 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 And the Bible reads, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he married. For he had married a who? A Ethiopian, if you have the King James Version, your version may say Cushite woman, but it's nevertheless the same. The Bible teaches us that here in Scripture, it suggests that this issue was not only something exclusive to our own experience. But here we find in scripture that Miriam and Aaron, the siblings of Moses, took it upon themselves to complain against Moses simply because he chose to marry a woman of a different nationality. And while we may think that this issue doesn't exist, you know, in the church, let us be reminded that Miriam was a prophetess. Amen. Aaron was a priest. Amen. So this is definitely something that we're susceptible to as well in the house of God. You see, the issue was that Miriam, Aaron, and Moses came from what was known as the Hebrew tribe, or it's also known as Jews, or however, Israelites, or however you may note it. But they all came from the lineage of Abraham. God had chosen Abraham and has said that out of you I will make a new nation, and he chose him to be the progenitor of his holy nation here on earth. And Israel was supposed to stand as an elite nation amongst all the other nations. So could you imagine being an Israelite back in the day? All of these things were, all of the oracles of God were given to you, and you can imagine how this could foster pride in the heart of an individual. And this is what Miriam and Aaron was experiencing in their day. And before I go any further it's, also a, further, it's also a caution to us because while we may take a lot of pride in our, in our origins or in our nationalities, wherever we come from, it's also a caution that we do not become so prideful in our origins that we begin to despise others. Amen. 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 God has given his people faith, grace and favor. Praise the Lord. But when we begin to become self-absorbed and where we come from, to the exclusion of others, then it becomes a problem. The Bible says that Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses simply because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. Now, the thing is that I don't believe that Miriam had an issue with Ethiopians specifically. At least I hope not, <laughs> you know. But... I believe that it stemmed from a different issue. The fact that Zipporah, Moses' wife, was not a Hebrew was the problem. You see, if Moses married an Asian, there would have still been an issue. If Moses had married a Mexican, there would have still been an issue. If Moses had married anyone besides in Hebrew, Miriam and Aaron would have had an issue. Because in the mind of an Israelite, only two nations existed. Did you all catch what I said? Okay, in the mind of an Israelite, it's important to recognize that only two nations existed, and that was either you were a Jew or you were a Gentile. Regardless of where you are from, who your origins came from, your lineage, either you were the chosen people of God or you were not. A son of Abraham, a child of Abraham, or you were not. It didn't matter if you were Hittite, Amorite, Jebusite, whatever it may be, Canaanite. In the mind of an Israelite, if you were not a child of Abraham, you were a Gentile. And this is kind of what spurred the opposition that we find here in Scripture. This sense of national pride was a common denominator 
in awe of any bitterness shown to different nations. So I want us to look at, in the brief time I have, just four ways that Israel was to stand apart from all different nations and how Christ solved that issue. Is that okay? Can I do that this morning? We're going to look at just four ways that Israel was supposed to be an elite nation and to stand apart from all other nations. If you have your Bibles, take them to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And we're in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7, and I'll be reading verse 12. Are we there? Amen. So it says this, Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant of mercy which he swore to your who? To your fathers, right? Now notice with me in verse 15, it says this, And the Lord will take away from you all what? all sicknesses, and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt, which you have known, but will lay them on all those who hate you. The first characteristic or thing that was distinctive about Israel is that they were to be a nation that excelled in health. They were to be the healthiest nation that existed. God had promised Israel that so far as they kept his commandments, that they would stand superior in health. Amen. Can you imagine going, taking a flight to a country, and you land only to find out that nobody in that country has sicknesses? That all the hospitals are empty. All the pharmacies are out of business. The dialysis centers are closed. Nobody has any ailment. And this was God's plan for Israel. So when you look at an Israelite, it's just not another nation, but you also recognize the fact that this was the healthiest nation that existed. How many of you want to be an Israelite this morning? Free from obesity, free from COPD, cardiovascular disease. This was God's promise to Israel. And the awesome thing about the gospel, praise the Lord, is that we don't need to be a child of Abraham to have the health message. Amen. God has given his Adventist church the health message, which we can freely partake of through faith. You see, it's interesting because I was looking at a study done, and researchers went out and they wanted to study the most healthiest population in the world. How many of you have heard of the term blue zoners? Just raise your hand. More of us need to hear about that term. You are a member of a blue zoner community. Blue zoners are a group of people who live up to about 100 years or older with healthy life. And what researchers have found is that one group of blue zoners were found in Loma Linda, Loma Linda California. They were known as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And they began to ask questions. How is it that this group of people are living up to 100 years old? Actually, they were living up to 10 years in addition to the average life expectancy. So if people were expected to live at 80, they found that these Christians in Loma Linda, Adventists were living up to 90 years old. And they began to ask questions, come to find out it was things like the Sabbath, adherence to God's health laws that kept them in good health. So praise the Lord for his health message. Amen. And the fact that, you see, I remember embracing the Adventist message, and I'm going to move on here in a minute. But when I first came into the church, I was more than 340 pounds. You should see my, some of you don't believe me. I'll, ask me to show you my pictures, I'll show you. I was a chubby guy, just got off the football team in high school, and I was humongous. Coming to the church just to find out people are eating tofu and soy milk, and I'm like, what, is, what kind of stuff is this, you know? <laughs> like, what's going on here? Where's the meat? Where is the, and I'm from Nigeria, so you know, we have meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know. So this whole tofu thing, I couldn't get down with. But come to find out that the Bible actually had interest in me being healthy. And come to find out Ellen White had books upon the health message. So what we're getting to today is that as a member of God's nation, we can obtain a health that is distinct from the world. 
The first characteristic of Israel is that they were to be an elite nation in, as so far as their health. The second thing that distinguished Israel is that they were also to be the most wealthiest nation on earth. Deuteronomy chapter 15, let's go there really quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15, and when you're there, you can say amen. amen. The Bible reads, says this, and we'll be reading in verse 6. It says, for the Lord your God will bless you just as he promised you, right? You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not do what? Borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. Number two is that God's nation was to be the most wealthiest. God had promised Israel that through keeping his laws regarding economy, that they were to exceed in their wealth. He would bless them. And it's interesting because no nation was required to give as much as Israel. God required from them a tithe, an offering, ministry to the poor, a year of release of debts, a year of release of lands, the 50th year, and after all of this giving, you would expect these people to be broke, <laughs> you know? But this was not so in Israel. Israel was the opposite. The more they gave, the more they received. God blessed them through a miracle. And notice that the Bible says you shall lend to how many nations? How many? Many. What do you call somebody that can loan to many nations? Some of us can only lend to one person at a time, you know? <laughs> but Israel was a very rich nation. Not only were they to lend, but they were also never to borrow because God always supplied their needs. Now, recall that the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, we don't need to go there, but it says that the rich shall rule over the poor, right? The borrower, borrower shall be servant to the lender, right? So through their economy, through their, through their um, blessing in finance, Israel was also supposed to rule over all the nations simply because they were lending to all the nations. Point number two is that God's people were wealthy. I don't have time to go into all the people in our history, you know, who started out paying tithes and became millionaires. Many of you may know about people like the Quakers or Rockefeller or Kellogg. These were all multi-millionaires who actually gave much to the church. If we are having trouble with our money, go to God this morning, amen? If you're, well, how do they say it? If your money is looking funny and your change is looking strange, what do you do? <laughs> go to the Lord. He'll take care of you, amen? God's people were to be the healthiest. God's people were to be the wealthiest. And the last point I want to mention in this regard is that God's people were also to be the most intelligent. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6. Let's go there. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6. Are we there? And it says this. Therefore, be careful to observe them, speaking about the commandments, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear you all the, I'm sorry, this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this is a great nation, is a wise and understanding people. Through giving Israel the law of God, God's people were also to experience a certain wisdom and a certain understanding that was a marvel to the surrounding nations. Now, I want to read this quote from the book of Education, one of my favorite books. And it says this, the mind occupied with commonplace matters only becomes dwarfed and enfeebled. If never taxed to comprehend grand and far-reaching truths, it after a time loses the power of growth. Did you catch that? Notice what it goes on to say. As a safeguard against this degeneracy and a stimulus for development, nothing else can equal the, nothing else can equal 
the study of God's word. As a means of intellectual training, the Bible is more effective than any other book or all other books combined. The greatness of its themes, the dignified simplicity of its utterances, the beauty of its imagery, quicken and uplift the thoughts as nothing else can. No other study can impart such mental power as does the effort to grasp the stupendous truths of revelation. The mind thus brought in contact with the thoughts of the infinite cannot but expand and strengthen. Praise the Lord. Spirit of Prophecy records that if we are looking for an increase in our mental faculties, then we need to go to the Bible. If we are looking to do better in our book work, in our academia, we need to go to the Holy Scriptures. And this is what set apart Israel from other nations, because while other nations were studying, you know, Harry Potter and, you know, Housewives of L.A., whatever it may be, God's people were doing what? Studying the word of God. Tracing genealogies, prophecies, all of these different things were their study by day and by night, and it gave them a certain breath and vigor of mind. God's people were to be the healthiest. God's people were to be the wealthiest. And God's people were to be the wisest. Amen? You know, I remember uh, growing up, my mom used to always tell me that early to bed, early to rise makes one healthy, wealthy, and wise, you know? But it's the word of God, amen? Mom, you are still right, you know? <laughs> Mom is always right. <laughs> but it's the word of God that imparts that vigor and that excellence of character. And this was God's plan for Israel. Finally, Israel was supposed to be a holy nation. And this, is, was, the, this was the supreme distinguishing factor that while they excelled in not only secular things, they were also to excel in character and to be to the world a witness and a light of the character of God. I don't know about you, but I'd very quickly trade in my Nigerian attire to be an Israelite. I'd very quickly drop, you know, all of my cultural traditions to obtain the traditions of Israel. God had a nation here on earth who was to stand as a representative, as ambassadors to the kingdom of God. But the only issue that we find in scripture is that as we read in the account of Miriam, Aaron, and Moses, that this eliteness of a nation turned out to be problematic. Why? Because Israel began to take pride in their nation and began to despise others. So this was a problem for the Jew in that it created a stumbling block because now they thought more highly of themselves. And it was a problem for the Gentiles because they felt like they were excluded from the favor of God. So as I wrap it up this morning, I just want to share how Christ would come and solve this issue. Is that okay? How would Christ solve this issue that we witness? Even in our day, the, book says, the Bible says in the book of Galatians, let's go there. Galatians, and we'll read in chapter 3. Galatians in chapter 3. Are we there? And it says this. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all what? One. In Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Someone should have said amen. I only heard a couple. <laughs> Did we catch that? The Bible teaches that if we have faith in Christ, then there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave nor free, men, male or female, meaning that we are all 
we all have access to the grace and favor of God. Amen. In Christ, we are one. And this wall of separation that has existed so long in our world is broken down through the cross. You see, what Christ did on the cross, he did what our world has been seeking to do for ages. For some reason, we think that signing a bill into activity like the Emancipation Proclamation can all of a sudden change the hearts of men. Signing peace treaties and all these different things between different nations and different countries can all of a sudden change how I feel about somebody else. But that is not what we find. All of this bitterness towards someone else still continues to persist, but what Christ has done on the cross has abolished that wall of separation. He has made us one through Christ. And the awesome thing is that in addition to Christ's go for unit for salvation in his death was also his goal for unity. Christ, through his death and resurrection, has given us all oneness that we have so long sought for. Through faith in Christ Jesus, we can all be an Israelite in spirit. Amen. Amen. God is welcoming us into his nation. While we may take pride in different places that we come from, we must recognize that God has himself established a nation in this world, and he is welcoming us to be a member of that nation, where we can also experience the blessings of being healthy, financially successful, amen, and also wise. And the thing that's awesome, and I believe somebody mentioned earlier, is that when you think of this in light of heaven, the fact that in heaven we will not need to celebrate an international Sabbath, because we will all be one in Christ. Amen. The fact that in heaven, we will not have to all wear different robes coming from different places because we will all have a white garment, amen. amen. Our food will all be taken from one tree of life, amen. amen. Even our language will be the same. We will all sing the song of the redeemed. Amen. God has given us what nobody else can give us, a love for one another, a love for our neighbor through Christ and through Christ only. How many of you want to decide this morning that I want to be a member of God's nation? Amen. Is that your desire? Can I see your hands? How many of us want to decide this morning that I too want to be a partaker of the blessings of Israel? I believe that it is Christ's desire that all of us would trade in the pride of our own nations and take pride in his nation. Amen? Amen. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. I just want to make two simple appeals this morning. And I want to give us the opportunity to make this commitment. Because I believe that the struggle sometimes is that we take too much pride in where we come from. The fact that in light of all of the customs and traditions of our own or uniqueness of our own cultures, we begin to overlook the blessings of being involved in God's culture. So how many of us want to make a decision this morning and some of us have already, may have already made this decision, and that's okay, that I want to relinquish any pride and take pride in the kingdom of God. I want to become a member of the kingdom of God this morning. If that's you, just go ahead and slip your hand in the air. If you just want to say, I want to become a member of God's nation. Amen. And God sees your hands. The second appeal I want to make is for those who have already made this decision, but we are not partaking of the customs of Israel. You see, we should be able to tell where somebody is from based on how they look, based on how they dress, based on how they look, eat. 
And if we are truly Israelites by faith, I believe that the world should be able to tell by how we look, by how we dress, by how we talk. The world should be able to tell that we are Christians because of our character. Truly, that is a wise and understanding person. Truly, that is a wise and understanding people. If you want to say, Lord, I've accepted this invitation, but I want to practice the customs of an Israelite. If that's you, just go ahead and slip your hand in the air and God sees you. Lord, I just want to embrace your health message, your message regarding finance, your message regarding education. I want to spend more time studying the Bible. I want to embrace your character. God sees you. God sees you. Let us pray. Most kind and gracious Father, we thank you for the gift of life, breath, and all things. And we thank you for Jesus Christ who has made this possible. Father, Lord, we thank you that under this roof, a miracle is transpiring. That what the world has sought to do for ages through bills and through legislature, that you have accomplished through Jesus Christ. That through faith in him, we can all be one. So Father, this Sabbath morning, we just want to ask that you help us to have faith in Christ Jesus. To embrace your nation, to be one in him. And to look forward to your coming. When it will all be manifest. That your children are one. These things we ask for and pray. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.